Hi everyone, welcome to lecture one of biological rhythms, Sarcadian rhythms. Um, thanks to all who voted for this to be the first topic. Over the, f um, over the next couple of weeks, on a Sunday hopefully, I'll be breaking each topic down and building on the knowledge from the previous weeks. So before we start, here are key terms that you need to know for this topic. Endogenous pacemakers in is our body's internal clock. This has been linked to the suprachiasmatic nucleus located in our brain, also known as the SCN. This internal clock gears our body up to do certain types of behaviour. The endogenous pacemakers interlinks with the exogenous Zeitgebers, which is all the environmental cues we have such as sunlight, social interaction, noise and food. For example, the SCN will detect sunlight and the sunlight, this signal sends our, for our body to reduce the amount of melatonin produced. Melatonin is a sleep hormone that triggers the onset of sleep. Because our internal clock has it up, detected light, it now means we no longer need to sleep. So it influences our physiological behaviour of waking up. Obviously, as we know, there are different types of circadian rhythms. Um, circadian rhythms just generally mean um, about 24 hours. So, the sleep-wake cycle, as we know, is like a 24-hour clock. So, we sleep for 8 hours and hopefully most of us are awake for 16 hours through the day. For the purposes of, obviously, this particular lecture and your future examination questions, um, you're most likely to get, you only need to focus on learning two of the circadian rhythms. Right, the first circadian rhythm is the popular sleep-wake cycle. Um, the reason why um, it's quite popular is simply because we all do it. Psychologists have been fascinated with just how much influence our endogenous pacemakers and our exogenous Zeitgebers have on our sleeping patterns. For example, what would happen if we did not have any environmental cues? Would our sleep wake pattern still be 24 hours? Do we even need exogenous Zeitgebers at all? Can our endogenous pacemaker deal with the rhythm itself? So, the most famous study on this topic was a case study, and excuse my pronunciations of this French name, is Michel Siffry. He conducted a number of studies in 1962, 1975 and 1999. So what he done was he isolated himself in a cave blocking himself from any exogenous sight scabbers like light and time cues. Okay, so you had none of this here. He ate and slept normally. Um, he found that the sleep, his sleep-wake cycle um, mirrored the 24-hour rhythm. So, for example, he slept for 8 hours a day and he was awake for 16 hours a day. However, there were odd days where the cycle would shift, for example, to 26 hours. So you might sleep a lot longer and be up a lot longer or even 48 hours. Okay, so what this now suggests is that our endogenous pacemaker, i.e. our internal clock, is fine by itself and still keeps a 24-hour rhythm. However, it does show that the exogenous Zeitgebers, so, so our light and our time cues, for example, are, are important to keep our rhythm constant daily as there were days when it increased a bit. So when it increased to 48 hours and 26 hours, for example, it was a bit off on those particular days. But generally, it was around this 24 hours. So what it's telling us that we need our exogenous Zeitgebers to keep our bodies in check each day. So this therefore shows support of the existence of an exogenous pacemaker. Yes, yeah? so we have we all have one. The second supporting study by Folkard in 1985, and what um, this researcher done was place 12 individuals, also in a cave, a bit like the first one, without any exogenous sight buggers like light, and told them to wake up at 7.45 a.m. and go to sleep every day at 11.45 p.m. So what the researchers gradually done is quicken the time. So they were looking at times, for example, at so about 7.45, okay, we need to wake up. 11.45, okay, we need to go to sleep. But gradually, they're quickening the time to make it resemble a 22-hour cycle. Obviously, the participants didn't actually, weren't actually aware of this. The participants, all of them, with the exception of one person, sorry, with the exception of one person, um, still maintained the 24-hour cycle. So, again, even the clock, if the clock was saying 7.45, they'll still want to sleep. 
because technically the research has kind of messed about with them a bit. So they probably wouldn't have waken up to like nine something or felt like waking up till 9.45 or something like that. Again, this supports the idea that we have an exogenous pacemaker and exogenous site, um, we have, and sorry, endogenous pacemakers and exogenous zeitgebers like light and time only have an influence up until a certain point. So the clock, for example, was only having an influence. It was fine when it showed us what the correct time was, but when it wasn't showing us what really what the correct time was, it really didn't have as much influence because their bodily clocks were still functioning the way it wanted to, and that was around a 24-hour rhythm. So, and finally, Ashoff and Weather in 1976, what they done is they placed participants in a World War II bunker without the influence of any exogenous cytogabers. They found that their sleep-wake cycles mainly kept to the 24-hour cycle, give or take a few hours. So sometimes, some days it was 24-hour cycle, some days it was 29-hour cycle, but generally it was around 24 hours. Okay. The second um, circadian rhythm um, that we're going to be looking at, again, you only need to remember two, yeah, um, is the core body temperature rhythm. So studies have found that our temperature is lowest at 4.30 a.m. in the morning, and that's around 36 degrees Celsius, um, Celsius and it's highest at around 6 o'clock in the evening, and the high around 38 degrees Celsius. So our bodies usually follow this daily rhythm. You can try this out if you want to one day. Just get a um, thermometer and um, um, and look at what your body temperature is at these particular times of the day. So Folkard in 1977 made researchers read a story to 12 and 13 year olds at either 9 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They found that students who had been read to at 3 p.m. had a better recall of the story one week later, that better comprehension and remembered 8% more meaningful information compared to the group that were read to at 9 o'clock a.m. This now is clearly supports the notion that the later on we get in a day, the higher our temperature and the better our cognitive ability. And finally, um, I'll say finally because I'm only giving you five studies. Five studies, guys, is all you're going to need to write an essay on this particular topic to still score the top A grades. So do not try and cram any more than this. Um, Gupta, in 1991, supported this, where this researcher found that students perform better at IQ tests at 7 o'clock in the evening than at 9 o'clock in the morning and at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Again, this is now suggesting that our exogenous pacemaker, that is our body temperature, interacts with the exogenous Zeitgebers, in this case the time of day and amount of light to affect our behaviour. In this case, it affects our cognitive abilities. So guys, that marks the end of lecture one, understanding the two main circadian rhythms. Next week, what I'm going to be doing is um, evaluating the research I used today, Ms. Maduga style, and giving you key tips on how to go about evaluating the information I went through in this particular lecture. So what I want you to do for me is just um, follow me, number one, on Twitter, and let me know what you think of today's lecture. And also let me know if you have any questions and stuff. And I'll do would try my best very um very much so to answer you during the week. So I'll see you next Sunday.